Hello everybody, welcome to History of Money. Professor Barth here, history professor at Arizona State University. Lecture 32, part A, we're going to take a look at America's entry into World War I. Part B, hyperinflation in Weimar, Germany. Fascinating topic, of course. And in part C, we'll take a look at Britain in the post-war period in the 1920s and what happens to the gold standard in Europe after World War I. All right, so last time, presidential election 1912, Wilson becomes president in March of 1913. Eight months later, we have the Federal Reserve Act, which Wilson signs into law on December 23rd. And then eight months after that, war breaks out in Europe, known as the Great War. We remember it as World War I between the Allied powers, pictured there in the green, the chief being Britain, France, and Russia, against the central powers, Germany, Austria-Hungary, Ottoman Empire. Brutal, brutal war, obviously. A ghastly war, a war from hell. Probably the most hellish war in world history and I would say even more so than, than even World War II, it, it just the, the trench warfare, the no man's land, the, the mustard gas, the millions and millions of dead. And of course, there were millions dead in World War II as well. But man, this was just um, absolute catastrophe in Europe. And I would argue maybe the uh, the most catastrophic event in the history of Western civilization. At bare minimum, it's right up there. Absolute devastation. That war began in the summer of 1914, and the U.S. is like, we're staying out. <laughs> we're staying out. Yeah, we don't have a dog in this fight. We're going to let Europe deal with it. We want nothing to do with it. And that... Really, that position really harkened back to Washington's neutrality proclamation all the way back in the 1790s when Britain and France and most of Europe were in, in war over the French Revolution and President Washington, with great wisdom, just said, you know what, we're staying out of these affairs. It's not our business, we're, we're staying out altogether. And that's how most Americans felt about this conflict as late as 1916. Now, public opinion was beginning to empathize more with the Allied powers for a number of reasons. Uh, when the Germans invaded Belgium in August of 1914, reports came back uh, about all these atrocities that, that took place. It was called the Rape of Belgium. The Germans were portrayed in the press as, uh, as monsters, brutes. And, and some of those accusations were, had an element of truth to them. Some of those accusations were fabricated or exaggerated by the British, um, a, a mixture of both. And then in 1915, a passenger line called the Lusitania was sunk by a German U-boat. The Germans gave advance warning, hey, this, you know, the ship is carrying uh, supplies to, Brit to Britain. Um, therefore, it's subject, perhaps, to, to attack. Uh, the warnings were ignored. Nonetheless, uh, that obviously reflected quite poorly on the Germans and the court of American public opinion. But still, America is neutral and, and feels strongly enough in that direction that Wilson runs on this campaign slogan. He's kept us out of war in 1916. War in Europe, peace in America. God bless Wilson. Nevertheless, Behind the scenes, there's a lot going on, and this is a history of money class. So, oh, there's the electoral map. Look at that. Wipe out. Wilson wins handily in 1916, primarily on this on this campaign promise. But behind the scenes, a lot's going on, especially in the realm of finance. Okay. And it has to do with J.P. Morgan and company. Now, J.P. Morgan, a man, died in March of 1913, even before the Federal Reserve Act. Nevertheless, the company lives on, of course, the investment bank. 
and his senior partner, pictured here, Henry Davidson. If you've watched previous lectures, you will recognize that photograph because yeah, he was a, an attendee at the Jekyll Island meeting in November 1910, which eventually gave us the Federal Reserve Act. Henry Davidson, senior partner of J.P. Morgan, uh, uh, rushes over to England in order to cement a deal with the British Treasury and with the Bank of England by which um, Davidson and, and J.P. Morgan will have a monopoly on underwriting all the sale of all allied bonds in the U.S. Okay, now remember when underwriter is. An underwriter assumes the risk of selling securities, whether it's corporate or government, in this case government, and the profit lies in what's called the underwriting spread. And the underwriting spread is, is the, the difference at which you know, the underwriter makes the initial purchase and then where the amount they sell it for. And so J.P. Morgan uh, secures this. And you look at the number of bonds that were sold within the U.S. banking system, and it is just beyond lopsided. Between 1914 and the end of 1916, U.S. banks purchased British bonds to the amount of $2.3 billion. $2.3 billion, which would be close to, in today's dollars, about $60 billion worth of, of British bonds, maybe a little more than that. German bonds, U.S. banks purchased to the amount of $27 million. <laughs> okay. Um, that's not even close, all right? And, uh, and, and so it's no secret what side the U.S. banking system is on. Moreover, the head of the New York Fed, the governor of the Federal Reserve Bank of New York, was Benjamin Strong Jr., again, another Jekyll Island attendee, and another Morgan man. Benjamin Strong obligingly increases the money supply coming out of the New York Fed, lowers interest rates in much of this newly created credit between 1914 and 1916, goes straight to, to purchase those British bonds. And so there's a lot of coordination here between the British government, the Bank of England, J.P. Morgan Company, and the New York Fed. All right, And this is all going on as Wilson is talking about keeping us out of war. There's the election, November 1916. Within six months, America's in, at war. On April 6, 1917, Congress votes to declare war on Germany. Now, what role exactly did the banks play in the U.S. entering the war? That's disputed. Historians disagree on that question. There are, there were obviously other factors that went into it. In January of 1917, the Germans announced that they were resuming unrestricted submarine warfare, meaning if you were a, uh, an American merchant ship and you were in the North Atlantic and it looked like you were trading with the British, you were uh, liable to be sunk by a U-boat. And in fact, American merchant ships were sunk by U-boats in the North Atlantic after that resumed. And, and the goal there for the Germans was to interrupt the, those transatlantic supply lines from Britain and the, between Britain and the United States. By the way, J.P. Morgan and company not only secured a monopoly on underwriting, but the J.P. Morgan company was also the sole purchaser of, of, uh, of goods and supplies from the United States that went to, the, to help the uh, French and British war effort. There's a lot of cooperation going on there. The Germans are aware of it, obviously. And then in January 1917, a telegram sent by the Germans to Mexico, it's called the Zimmerman Telegram, was intercepted by British intelligence and published in the American press. And in this telegram, the German government, in essence, tells Mexico, hey, look, if, if the United States declares war, if you end up allying with us, joining our side, and we win the war, we'll end up uh, helping you uh, uh, reclaim, um, re-annex the territory you lost in 1848 to the U.S. So New Mexico, Arizona, California will return to, 
to Mexico. This intercepted by British intelligence, published in the American press, and needless to say, sparks a total outrage. And so all those things considered, Wilson approaches Congress, asks them to declare war. Back then, Congress actually declared war. Uh, Congress hasn't declared war since World War II. I think we fought a few more since then, but I, I, uh, I digress on that point. But Wilson s said, this is, you know, asked them to declare war, called it a, a war to end all wars, a war to end all wars. And then also, in addition, declared it a war to, quote, make the world safe for democracy. And so the U.S. enters that conflict. 20 years later, a Senate committee headed by Republican Senator from North Dakota, Gerald Nye, investigated this question on why Wilson and the United States went to war. And in investigating this question, he, he took a look at the banking industry and arms manufacturers, munitions industry, and concluded, came up with all the figures, including the figures about bond sales, and concluded that yes, indeed, the banking system as well as the munitions industry, the arms industry, played a major role in prompting the country to go to war. And uh, people refer to this as war profiteering, war profiteering. If you're wondering why we're talking about this in history money, well, war and money go hand in hand. Not only do you need money to finance a war, buying supplies and all the rest, as we've seen now for a long time, but also there's money to be made in war. And so the Nye Committee comes up with this, uh, with this, uh, um, commits this investigation. And afterward, uh, a lot of disillusionment in America as a result of this investigation and before, frankly, about America's decision to enter the war. Then that later played a role into America's hesitation uh, for joining in uh, World War II, okay, what became World War II. But uh, this had a, a big impact. And on in the middle of this committee, um, a, the most decorated Marine in, in U.S. history up to that point, General Smedley Butler, Major General Smedley Butler, published a book called War is a Racket. Now, Butler had, was a U.S. Marine Corps officer during World War I. Like I said, he was the, uh, at that time, the most decorated Marine in U.S. history. He received the Medal of Honor on two different occasions, as well as other medals. He wrote this book in 1935 called War is a Racket and just outlined all the different ways in which corporate interests profited from the war and concluded that basically the Americans were sell, sold a uh, false bill of goods had a big impact on American public opinion at that time. And then we also can't help but remember, this is a bit later, but the same idea, money and war. In January of 1961, outgoing President Dwight D. Eisenhower gave a farewell address. Now, usually farewell addresses aren't that big of a deal, not much is said. Every now and then, though, a farewell address will make some big statements. Washington's farewell address was really big. Eisenhower gives a, a one of the mo biggest speeches, most important speeches in American history. It ranks up there, right? It doesn't beat Gettysburg Address, but nonetheless, it's, it's up there. And... Eisenhower says this, in the councils of government, we must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military industrial complex. The potential for the disastrous rise of misplaced power exists and will persist. Then he goes on. It's actually a pretty wild speech. In, uh, later in the speech, he, he also warns that in the future, public policy may become, quote, captive to a scientific technological elite, end quote. <laughs> wow. Uh, quite quite a uh, pressing ob observation there, Mr. President. Um, Eisenhower was an underrated president, in my view. Underrated president. If you look into Eisenhower, you know, not certainly not imperfect administration, but uh, um, a very respectable president, president in my in my view. Well, 
That concludes part A. Part B, let's take a look at what happens in Germany following World War I. See you there. Bye.